today I want to make a video about an incredibly rare car. This is an AC Brooklands Ace. It never been any of my videos before because this is the only one in Thailand and it's just popped up. It's just resurfaced since it arrived in 1997. It's been pretty much hidden away most of its life. Anyway, to get the ball rolling, the AC Brooklyn's Ace was built in the mid 90s in the UK and they built 46, just 46. And out of that 46, 11 left the UK. Two went to Australia, one went to Saudi Arabia, one went to Germany, and one went to South Africa. And the other six came to Asia. And out of that six, five disappeared into the Sultan of Brunei's sports car collection, barely to be seen again. The 6-1 came to Thailand to a new importer that was just set up with big ambitions. That's this car. After all that time, two and a half decades, it's reappeared and a friend of mine bought it. So I just wanted to just jump straight in here and make a video. I wanted to explain the story of this car because it's got an interesting story. And I wanted to talk about the Brooklyn's 8 and introduce the car because it's ultra rare and it also has a fantastic story as well. So get started. So the first thing I want to say about this car is I am blown away by it completely. It's just an amazing car. There's so much going on here. I've looked at it a few times now and each time I look, I get more and more out of it. Something unique, something special about it. This is a car built with a lot of passion and huge ambition. The Brooklyn's Ace has an amazing story and it has some amazing features as well, starting with the stainless steel chassis, the first production car in the world to have a stainless steel chassis. Now you'd think the design, the development, that kind of thing, you'd leave it to the OEMs when you're a small company with not a big budget, or you'd leave it to Elon Musk with his pickup. But no, AC plunged in, they built a stainless steel chassis and all the bodywork is aluminium. Already, this is something on the special side. And we get straight to the point, the reoccurring theme of this car, the over-engineering that went into it. AC didn't want to build something to compete with TVR or the big engine MGs. It wanted to compete with brands like Jaguar, and I think they had an eye on a Mercedes SL as well. That's kind of the market share they were looking at. So this is a car with a lot of ambition. It didn't work out in the end, but this car has got so much going on. So over the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna poke around this car. I hope you're gonna stick around and I show you more about what's going on and the history of this car in Thailand. So first, let's do some background. AC, one of the oldest car brands in the world, staggering through life, through bankruptcies, trickling out cars, but still alive. And then in the early 80s, a guy called Brian Anglis, who had a company called Autocraft that built Cobra replicas and made money out of them. He went to Ford to talk big. He would joint venture with Ford. They would build cars using all Ford parts, Ford engines, and they would sell them through Ford dealerships. AC would look at cracking the big time. No more just knocking out the Cobra replicas. Ford bought into his sweet talk. So the company moved to a factory in Brooklyn, where you get the Brooklyn's in the name from, and in 1986, they rocked up with a concept called the Ace of Spades. And it went down a storm, a very angular 80s style, very minimalist, very clean, very sharp. Ford liked it and it was go. That car was built on the Sierra, so it was a two plus two. It had a Sierra V6 engine. It had all the platform, everything Sierra wise going on in it. But then Ford and Brian fell out. AC was back on its own with no money. 
the usual story, but Brian hadn't jacked his dream. And then to everyone's surprise, in 1991, he rocked up with the first prototype of this car. And it had been completely changed. That sharp 80s styling had gone for this more smooth, curvaceous 90s look. It was styled by IAD, which are famous automotive styling company in the UK and they had done a terrific job. And what I said before, it was over engineered to the degree. That prototype got a three litre V6 engine in it. And because it kicked goodbye to the Sierra parts, the two plus two was gone and it was a straight two seater. Two years later, 1993, the car hit production. There were more changes from that concept. It got the 4.9 V8 Mustang engine under the bonnet. Brian could have saved himself a lot of money in development if he'd just gone straight for that option because it's pretty obvious where engine was gonna be in this car when it hit the showrooms. There were some other changes. The pop-up headlights were history as well. And they got these unusual styled headlights that are very distinct in their place. The Cobra engine put out around about 230 to 260 horsepower. It's all a bit vague, the data, but that kind of shows that really they were looking at this as more of a Grand Tourer than just a balls out sports car like a TVR say. So it went into production, it went into the showrooms and to cut a long story short, it flopped and it flopped big time. By the time production ended about four years later, they'd built 46. That's about one a month. And in its truest tradition, AC went bankrupt again. The dream of the Brooklyn's Ace was over, but there were 46 now in the world, 46 interesting unique cars and one in Thailand. So that's the background to the Brooklyn Ace done. And now we want to talk about this car and AC in Thailand. This car was built in 96 and it landed in Thailand in 97, one of the last off the line. Came to a new importer with big, big ambitions. He put down a quota for 12 of these cars. I can't imagine the Thai market absorbing 12 Brooklyn's Aces, but anyway, this guy thought so, and he also put down for two Cobras. But first of all, he got one Brooklyn's Ace and one Cobra. The price for the Ace was 7.05 million. The price for the Cobra was 8.4 million. So high priced, but sellable. And this car sold straight away and it was off the importer's books. So he was impressed, a good start. But then disaster struck. The Asian financial crisis wiped Thailand out. The BART was left to float. And when it settled, you're talking round about 11 million for this car around about 12, 13 million for the Cobra. There is no way you're gonna find buyers at that price. AC in Thailand, a short story. It was over. It was dead in the water. It's good night Vienna for AC in Thailand. But this car is still here. And for two decades, in fact, exactly two decades, this car stayed pretty much out of sight. And in fact, it's got 2,200 kilometers on the clock. So it really was out of sight. Big thank you to the owner for letting me loose on this car. Let me poke around and have a look at it. And now I'm gonna show you the details and the features why I think this is so special and so interesting. So we're going to look at this car. We've got to start with the styling because it's got a very distinct styling to it. It was done by a company called IAD. That's short for International Automotive Design, based in the south of England. 
and they did design work for OEMs across the world. And as you'll see, when I take you around the back, they also did the MX-5 amongst many cars. Anyway, this has got a very strong front end. I think in photos it doesn't look as good, but in real life this looks big and imposing, a long bonnet, and then this kind of Jaguar Aston Martin style grill. Looks good, it works in real life with this big front end, and the way the clamshell comes up here as well, that gives it a distinctness. And these big side lights and indicators, very 90s feel again, so it kind of slotted into that feel. The headlights, it's got this big recess, and it's got E30 headlights. Unmistakable, those lights. Then, if I take you around the side, We've got quite a lot of styling going on here, the way it curves down and it also comes in and sweeps out, which gives it a really strong feel. And because these parts are all aluminium hand rolled, that is difficult to achieve. Then the haunches come right out, giving it a bit of a muscular feel, a bit of a muscle car feel to it. We've got a Jaguar filler cap, you cannot mistake that. And then we come round to the back end. And the first thing I've got to say is MX-5. And what I said before, the designers, IAD, they did the MX-5. So they've taken cues that they're familiar with and were really successful as well, reinterpreted them into a bigger dimension car and done it really well. This all works really nicely. This number plate recess. And then I really like at the bottom of the bumper, you've almost got this like splitter like cutout ahead of the game and then you've got the bumper molds round the exhaust the reflectors and the fog lights and the reversing light and it gives it a really luxurious 90s feel something like maybe a maserati or a lamborghini this kind of outrageous feel you could imagine someone like someone from duran duran or even someone like Tacky, like Rod Stewart, rolling up the high street to the club in a car like this in the 90s. It nails the period, it looks great, and it still looks fantastic today. This electric folding hardtop, it folds in very nicely, so you've got this big boot section. It feels very aerodynamic, it's very smooth and low. It looks good. And then we've got some tweaks like this door mirror, which I have just seen on this Citroen over here. Unfortunately, some less quality features like these Ford door handles made out of a really cheap plastic. And we've got a rubber trim coming down the door, which was very much the style in the 90s. So I think this design is really, really nice. I absolutely am bowled over by this car. So much going on. As I said before, the chassis is stainless steel, a world first for a production car. Now, the design is the work of Len Bailey. He's an old hand Ford engineer. He was credited with a big part of the GT40 program in the 60s, the famously won Le Mans, and the P69, which followed, which wasn't so successful. And he went on to do a lot of engineering on race and rally cars. He did work for companies like Lola, and he's credited with a couple of Frank Williams's early F1 designs. As a consultancy, he did this, and you can see the race car feel. Often with these low volume cars, you lift up the clamshell and you can see daylight everywhere. This is all boxed off so neatly and so well like a race car it's really well designed under here and we're back to over engineering and clearly len being a long time oem man he hasn't cut the corners here but he hasn't quite realized maybe the ac don't have the budget that ford did but this is a thoroughly well designed car and when i said before he did design work for some people like lola you get that feel when you look at this car it's pretty, 
pretty nice under here. And just a few details I'll throw in this segment. It weighs 1440 kilos, not too heavy, not too light, but it's a big car and this is a big engine. And it's got a pretty perfect 50-50 weight distribution. When I say a big car, it's 4.42 meters long and the wheelbase is 2.472 meters. So a pretty decent piece of kit for the 1990s. The engine. Now after playing around with a few options, the Cobra, the sister car, was gonna donate. It's 4.9 V8. It's a big engine, it's a big engine bay. And what I said in the chassis part is really well designed around it. So it's really nice when you lift that huge clamshell up and look at it, it looks awesome. It looks powerful and it looks menacing. That engine is coupled up to either a five-speed Borg Warner manual transmission or a four-speed auto. Thailand is an auto market, so no doubt it had to come here with an auto box. My conclusion was the exterior of this car looks pretty good. How does the interior stack up? And I think the answer is this is also pretty good. But when you get in it, I haven't even adjusted the seats backwards. There's still maybe four or five inches or more to go there. And I'm comfortable in here. So for tall people like me, I'm 186 centimeters. It's a comfortable Grand Tourer. The dashboard is covered in Conley leather, which goes down on the center console, across here on the center trunking, the seats, really nice. It looks really nice finishing this leather, and this leather is brand new. It's like it came out of the showroom. It looks absolutely beautiful. Wood round the instruments, wood on the center panel, Again, that's that 90s luxurious feel and a bit more wood around the switches here and an insert across the door card as well. So that looks pretty nice. And again, this oval on the dashboard and then it gives way to a suede or Alcantara style on here, which is very, very nice. Well designed, well contoured. I like this a lot. It feels like a Grand Tourer. This steering wheel, it's really got that 90s sporty feel to it before you had airbags, before you had switches on the wheel. This feels like a pure racing style wheel, like a race car wheel from the old days. The switch gear here, the bezel round, the steering column, this hazard warning light switch, not so nice. They are cheap Ford parts. Out of the Ford parts bin, they don't look great. And there's one or two other cheap Ford parts inside here that don't add up to the experience. These air vents don't look great, and these dials look a little bit on the cheap side as well, but they're just minor details in what is a nice cockpit. These seats feel supportive, real bucket seat style, look great. And then we get onto the specification of this car, because this car is highly specified. It's got air conditioning, of course, we've got the dials here, and there you can see these two switches, are for the heated seats left and right. So you've got heated seats here. And then you've got electric windows, of course, and I've got electric door mirrors as well. So kind of well equipped. And the front screen is also heated. We've got another switch for that here. And stick into this segment as well, it's got power steering on it, which you would need with a car like this. The only thing I don't really like in here, to be honest, is the auto stick. But Thailand is an auto market. You've got to specify the auto box if you want to sell it here. So overall, this is a nice cockpit. I can imagine cruising the roads, top down, people looking at me like, what car is that? And that's what you want really when you're driving a car. So very, very cool. I like the outside, I like the inside but certainly the leather, the stitching, the steering wheel, everything is like brand new. And when you've done 2,274 kilometers, the steering wheel leather is like new. There are no wear marks at all yet. This car is barely run 
in. That's pretty much it, going through the details of the car. I don't want to get too much into this. I really want to just give you a broad brush, keep you interested, get you a bit of feeling for this car. But a few more details to finish. The suspension, double wishbones all around. Twin shocks on the rear. Again, we're back to that over-engineering. The brakes, vented discs all around. It's got ABS, and while I'm here, it's got this huge brake master cylinder. It runs on 16 inch OZ wheels, straight out of the showroom. OZ is a good brand to have on your car. 225 50 16s on the front, 235s on the rear. And that's it for the details. And then we get to the service book. And the first thing I like is this caution card. Low ground clearance. The outer body is entirely of aluminium. Be careful not to damage it. And then we look at the service book, four cup data card with an AC on it, tire pressures, consumables, that sort of thing. Beautiful, the address, warranty cards. This is beautiful. And they've stuck actual photographs. They've like glued them into it, really beautiful. And here we've got another photograph. There we've got Brian Anglis. And here we've got an introduction from him and another beautiful photo glued in. And then you can see it go right through servicing your car. Just 46 of these done. And then at the end, they got the service cards. That is very beautiful. And also what we've got is a Recaro manual that's come with the car as well, looking very yellow with age and another period typewriter written sticker on it as well beautiful so that's it just time to conclude and the word i take away from this past couple of hours exploring this car is over engineering over engineering has been a downfall of the british car industry for decades and when you're a big giant OEM, you can absorb the kind of money that you lose doing that. But when you're AC, you're living hand to mouth, car to car, you cannot afford that. So this car really, to be honest, it should never have been built. But it was built with passion, with huge ambition, with technical excellence going into it. This is something quite special. But like I say, 30 years ago in the 90s, they shouldn't have built it. But what you get now, 30 years later, in 2023, is something pretty special, something sorted, something you can drive and enjoy. So I think this was not a car for the 1990s at 50,000 pounds. This is a car for 2023, or whatever the price is going for, X million baht, it's a car for 2023. And while I'm on the 50,000 pounds, I wanna say another thing, tying in with the over-engineering, the word on the internet is, they lost 100,000 pounds per car. That is astounding. So it was costing them 150,000 to build this car. It was costing the customer 50,000 in the showroom you can't sustain that it's a completely crazy project but you get something that today is fantastic and i believe this car may be going on sale soon and i think the next owner is going to tip his hat to ac and be very thankful that back in the 90s they pushed the boat out to build something as good as this because in 2023 it's a cracking car and a cracking buy and you've got the only one in thailand and with all the ford parts bin stuff which some of it i turn my nose up a bit at but with all those ford bits with the mustang engine it's not going to be a difficult car to maintain the parts are going to be out there for it so that's my conclusion this is not a car for the 1990s this is a car for 2023